Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Shipping Professional Networks event number 97, co-hosted with DNV on cyber risk management of vessels. My name is Maria Dragomerli, and I am a board member of the SPNL and the technical superintendent with Helicon Shipping Enterprises. Today, I have the pleasure of hosting and moderating this event, and I will shortly introduce you to our speakers. Just a quick note for housekeeping, please share your questions with us at any point using the Q&A function and I will make sure to address as many of them as possible after the presentations. It would be appreciated if you can identify yourselves at the start of your message. Now, our first presenter will be Kostas Papadakis, who is a DNV's Business Development Management Manager for West Europe. Costas has served at sea as a marine engineer for 11 years, and before joining classification sector in 2006, he gained extensive experience as a private surveyor in Liverpool and took up the role of senior lecturer at Warshaw's Nighttime School in Southampton. Our second presenter will be Svante Einerson, who is responsible for DNV's Nighttime Cybersecurity Advisory Services globally. Svante has extensive experience from assessing the cybersecurity and um, of my time assets, as well as advising clients on ITOT security, cybersecurity management systems and risk management, training of staff and crew, and compliance against international regulations and standards. With this brief introduction, I will pass the mic on to Costas and let him start his presentation. Hello, everybody. Just give me a moment. So good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Kostas Papadakis, Business Development Manager for DNV UK. Um, Maria, thank you very much for your introduction. And uh, thank you for the SPNL for giving DNV the opportunity to present a very important topic. Uh, we will start with just a little bit of history uh, to remind ourselves how communication started in the, in the last uh, 150 years. So we have started with the Morse code and also at that time we used to have the telegram so everybody was waiting for a telegram in the house. Then of course we had the telex and then further on we still had this radio officer together with the radio room. I still remember the days that I was waiting outside of this one of these when I was at sea 1980s and 90s just to make a phone call to my my families and uh, friends. And of course, nowadays we have satellite communication. Of course, it's quite important now. And uh, it's more and more important because this is, could be uh, an important uh, possibility for a, a, a seaman to join a vessel if it's good, good communication with the, with, the, with the home. So digitalization is an important topic for most companies, board of directors today. I have been discussing with a lot of our clients that they're willing to adopt digital technologies faster than before. I have also read on the news that the average data downloaded per vessel doubled from less than four gigabytes per day in April to 20 to over eight gigabytes per day in October. Those are IMASAT figures. And they say that every six to eight months, this data will be doubled. In our industry, we see an opportunity to improve operational efficiency and reduce costs by introducing new technology, such as remote operation, real-time process, optimization, condition-based maintenance, etc. However, to realize this, we need to introduce more automation, integration, and connectivity on board. So the digitalization is bringing benefit to our industry. which is stay compliant with minimum interface in sim operation, bring the global technical expertise on board the ship wherever and whenever, and also improve quality and safety levels by using technology and data in new and smart ways. DMV Digital Class is progressing with new data enabled services, focusing on improving safety, quality, efficiency, and value for customers. Remote operation is especially useful during times of travel restriction. The last four years, DMV has stepped up 
our digitalization effort, and especially the last year due to COVID-19 restrictions. So everybody has accepted that digitalization has been accelerated by 10 years in the last year. So what we have done in TMB? A lot of services have been become digital. For example, we are the first one to have issued electronic certificates. So all our SIPs now, they have electronic certificates. Then we have used the, an email called technical access to technical experts, direct access to technical experts. So these are emails that you can send and you can get any uh, reply you want. And we, we apply machine learning to do all of these things. Then of course, we have the smart survey booking and we have centralized planning. So this in uh, all the operations that we have now uh, are through operation centers that we have in Germany and in Oslo. Also, we have Machine Maintenance Connect, which is a new service. So you can do the annual survey of a fleet of 50 or 40 vessels in a matter of hours from the office. And this is something that we have started and we have to in the last year, and a lot of things are coming up. Shipping is experiencing increasing pressure to decarbonize its operation and reduce emissions to air. In April 2018, the International Maritime Organization adopted an ambitious greenhouse gas emission reduction strategy to half GHG emissions from the national shipping by 250 and reduce the average carbon intensity of such shipping by at least 40% by 2030 and 70% by 2050, compared to 2008 data. We also see regional regulations market pulled from charters and banks and private and public initiatives are established to support and accelerate the carbonization. The pressure to reduce shipping GHG emission is exemplified by the recent Poseidon principle, the framework signed by major shipping banks to assessing the climate alignment of ship finance portfolio. In addition, major charters, Sea Cargo Charter, committed in October to 20 to car carbon dioxide emissions from the cargo business through common standards in line with the IMO. In the years to come, a number of stakeholders will be requesting transparent and comparable disclosure of a ship GHG performances. The Sea Cargo Charter is built around a contractual committer agreeing a standard charter party clause for the ship owner operators to share with the charterer the tonnage carried, distance sail, and fuel type and amount used for its voyage. We have essentially created the means to get voyage charter data into time charter forms with distance cargo fuel representative, representative from seat charter have said. So what I'm trying to say here, more and more data needs to be transported from the vessel on shore. As you will see, we will have the MRV, the IMO DCS data. We have the EOI of every vessel. And also you will see that we have uh, the different uh, people like the, the, the yearly report that you need to do for the MRV and the yearly report that you need to prevent for the DCS. So we have a lot of different information that the vessel has to be sent to uh, us all. So we now have a fleet, say for example, of 30 vessels. And if you think about it, and if you have you know, two charters and, and the, the each vessel attending about 10, 15 ports per year, and you have two banks, for example. So you're talking for approximately 600 emission reports that has to be sent. Also on top of that data, then you have reports that has to be sent to charters, insurance, managers, owners, agents, and plus the, uh, the reports that the classification society or the connection with the classification society has to be there. Also, don't forget, we have the social data that has to be also on board the vessel. So we have the data from emails, movies that people on board the vessel can download, social media, news that everybody on board the vessel needs to have. So the owner manager can now prepare more manuals online than before, and this will increase in the next couple of years. As you can see, the data that the current and future ship is downloading is increasing rapidly. However, to realize this, we need to introduce more automation, integration, and connectivity on board. The only way to realize this is in a safe manner, 
which also consider the risk of the new technology and implement suitable cybersecurity defenses. Now I will pass you to our expert Sven to explain to you how DND cybersecurity services can help you overcome those problems. Sven, over to you. Hey, thank you so much, Kostas. Um, let me see. Let me share, share my screen as well. Kostas, you have to stop yes, sharing your I'm, screen. Okay, just give me a moment. Yes, I'm all right. Okay. Here you are. Thank you. Let me see here. Okay. There we go. Great. So I'm very excited to, to be here as well with you. And um, for the introduction, both from Maria and from Costas, now I will try to deep dive into more aspects of how to uh, secure uh, maritime assets and what we have uh, in DNB uh, had for experience in the last couple of years on this topic. Uh, let me see if I can move on here. Okay, so I think uh, one aspect that we should mention in the beginning is of course that we have uh, a number of uh, reported events out there uh, already. Um, I've, I believe the Maersk incident is well known to everyone in the industry by now, uh, but also that other companies, major companies that are uh, uh, major respected companies, I would say as well, um, have suffered from incidents in the last couple of years. And uh, we see there is a, still a lack of reporting these uh, incidents in a transparent manner. Uh, but in any case, uh, there are more and more reports also coming into us as DNB, where it's not only the IT infrastructure on the shore side of the vessels that have been affected by these incidents, but also even control system, systems on board, uh, sometimes spread from the IT environment on board or even the IT environment on, uh, on the uh, shore side uh, to the control systems. So that is one of the key, I would say, driver in this uh, topic. The second one is, of course, what we, I believe everyone is very focused on this year, is the IMO uh, requirements. Uh, the resolution com came out a couple of years but it, uh, ago, but it uh, sort of came into effect from the 1st of January or for the first DOC audit that our ship manager had this year. So a couple of our clients all already have uh, had the audit uh, and a couple of them will still have it in there later on this year. Uh, basically what it says here and what we need to remember is that this is not a new requirement from IMO, uh, but it was actually in the ISM code from the beginning. We need to assess and manage all risks and therefore also cyber risks. Uh, the guidance document that is linked to this resolution also makes it clear that we are looking to not only the IT systems, not only reputation and financial loss uh, uh, scenarios, but also the OT system. So really safeguarding life and environment on board the vessels. Uh, secondly, the guidance uh, material also mentioned that the threats could be different in type. Um, there could be both intentional threats, uh, such as a hacker, but also unintentional one. Human error is something that we definitely need to take up. It could be from, both from the crew member, but also from the service engineer or someone else that comes on board or operates, uh, uh, integrates uh, uh, with our vessels. A key aspect of cyber risk management is actually to implement a defense in depth concept. And in the guidance material, they refer back to the NIST cybersecurity framework. Identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover is the key words that I use there. Uh, so the message is to not only focus our efforts towards trying to protect or to hinder something from happening, but also realize that a perfect system will never be in place. Uh, so we need to be able to respond and come back to normal operation if something happens, or I should say when something happens. Uh, furthermore, also refers back to international best practices, uh, standards and the event classification society uh, uh, recommendations. Someone uh, as the US Coast Guard came also out with uh, further guidance on this, and especially when it, we're talking about port state controls uh, starting from this year. After the first DOC has been executed this year, 
uh, then the pork state control uh, surveyors can come on board and actually look at the implementation of cybersecurity on board the vessels themselves. Uh, the first aspect they would be looking into is uh, poor cyber hygiene, is USB keys lying around, uh, the basic stuff basically. Uh, if there is an appearance of uh, uh, or malware uh, pop-up alarms or something like that on the on the computers. If the crew, by asking them, uh, if they're complaining about uh, poor uh, poor system or many problems with the systems, or even if uh, they can report of a considerable number of spoofed emails or similar. If the poor state control surveyor uh, identify one of these things or all of them. Uh, he might come to the conclusion, okay, let's make an, a more thorough investigation. And from, depending on the result of that into the investigation, it, it, the ship could even be detained. So it's not only about this year to make uh, standards uh, or, or procedures and policy on the paperwork from the, from the office side, but also to make sure that it's well implemented on board the vessels. I believe Costas also mentioned the third aspect of the third driver that we see uh, in the industry today, the digitalization. Huh? All these new nice services that we have in, in place and are increasingly uh, taking more and more space into uh, our daily operations is all dependent on data and, uh, and exchange of information between system and the outside world. And in order to harvest these benefits, we really need to look at both the security side of cyber, but also the safety side. And uh, I say this in two, two different aspects because one is more of this, again, the intentional threat, and the other one is the unintentional. It could be software bugs, it could be poor implementation of these uh, not proper uh, change management and these different things. And we need to look, look at all these both aspects at the same time in order to safeguard uh, and actually being able to harvest the benefits. Next slide is about uh, just giving you an, an overall picture of all the different requirements and standards and guidance out there. Not all of them, of course, are not in this pyramid, but uh, to give you at least a hierarchy and understanding how this is continuously actually developing and adding on top of this. The IMO on, on the top with uh, fairly little guidance and fairly little uh, explanation what they need, uh, it's applicable for ships and operation. Uh, the second one is the IX uh, UR uh, E22, which is uh, then focused towards uh, the new building projects. Uh, all of the, the major classification societies should have already implemented uh, those requirements into their main class requirements. So that should also be, already be covered. Then we have uh, IX recommendation 166 that came out last year, which is a maritime specific uh, cybersecurity guidance. Uh, this is a, as, as of now on a voluntary basis and could be applied to new building projects. Uh, then the BIMCO guideline, I believe I mentioned before, which is a good reference on, on maritime cybersecurity. Uh, our own uh, recommended practice on the risk management or resilience for maritime assets, the 04996. And the uh, OSD203 is all about what I mentioned before, uh, integrated software dependent system and how to make sure that we have a cyber safe uh, environment on board as well. We furthermore developed uh, a voluntary class notation and type approval schemes uh, in order to also safeguard and, and make uh, clear requirements and some sort of verification baseline in order to fulfill all the demands that are out there today. Uh, all of these maritime different standards and regulations and, 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 and demands are then actually uh, based on the foundation of uh, international standards, uh, which are not maritime uh, specific. They are the IAC standard here, 62443, is uh, control system specific, uh, and the ISO is more of uh, directed into the IT environment. And then we have the NIST cybersecurity framework that is uh, fairly well applicable uh, or, or spread in the US uh, um, uh, hemisphere. 
what do we then recommend how to roll this out and how to improve ourselves in, in terms of cybersecurity? Well, it, it's quite simple. It's, it's, not a, it's not a very complicated process. We recommend to assess the situation as it is right now. I'll go into the details uh, in a minute. Uh, then improve, uh, make sure that you actually uh, come and close those gaps that you find and then verify, make sure that the implementation has actually been done and not just that it remains as a paperwork uh, somewhere in a, in a drawer or somewhere. Work on the three pillars of cybersecurity uh, measures. Don't rely on only technology to solve your problem, but realize that also the human error and the people themselves need to be emphasized and the resources put on, on them in order to improve and follow new processes, follow new best practices and procedures that are the way of doing uh, our new work, both in uh, normal operation and also in um, uh, emergency situations. We recommend to, to start the process with having an organizational assessment and looking at the different uh, um, dimensions that is already mentioned by IMO and in this type of security framework, they identify, protect, attack, respond, recover, but also making sure that we have this management support from the beginning, that resources are, are there and that we realize that the whole uh, organization is in a continuous improvement phase because uh, cybersecurity will remain here, uh, it will stay and it will not uh, go away in the, uh, <laughs> in the future. Huh? Um, and, uh, and then make some sort of a checklist if it's against the IMO, uh, ISM standard, if it's uh, multiple different types of standards, that, that is fine. Just make sure that you have some sort of a baseline that you can go back to and, and uh, refer to. Uh, that is one, one side of the problem. The other way of looking at the problem could actually be also the risk-based and it's also required by the IMO and many other standards to, to go from the risk as, aspect. Looking at system by system, what could be the consequence in terms of uh, confidentiality uh, loss or integrity loss, someone is manipulating the system information or the availability, all of a sudden the system fails uh, and are, is not available to me anymore. The um, other aspects is the likelihood that could be quite challenging when we look at cybersecurity. And therefore, we recommend to use the approach in, the, in our RP that I just mentioned before uh, to actually look at it from an ease of access point of view. The more access points the system has, the likelier it is that uh, this system will be uh, jeopardized. One thing that is key, I, I believe as well, is to not just rely on these desktop uh, exercises and workshops and so on, uh, looking at this from a theoretical point of view, but also go on board the vessels themselves. Look at what are the interfaces uh, with the outside world, how are they protected? Interview the crew, understand how they normally operate, what is their, their understanding of, of the general threat, are they only concerned about the IT or do they also actually realize that OT system can be manipulated? Uh, third party uh, people coming on board, are they applying any type of uh, cyber requirements, uh, work permits before they start executing updates and so on and so forth? How is the onshore organization set up to actually effectively then support an emergency response scenario, for instance? And uh, maybe the most important, uh, looking at the system environment. How are the different systems, the IT system and the OT system, the different networks, are they segregated from each other or not? And also the system themselves, how are the hardening of these systems done? In reality, that could be quite different than what is on on the paper. Then how do we develop a uh, cyber uh, risk management system? Well, we rely on the very uh, common and, and well-known approach of plan, do, check, act. Uh, we start by saying, okay, we need some sort of a measurement in order to, to follow up on but year by year, uh, KPIs of some sort, how many has done the, the training in the, in the, for instance, in the, in the time frame that was defined. Then make sure that there's a system inventory, a complete understanding of what type of systems are there and what kind of uh, configurations they, uh, they have. Based on that information, you can make a cyber risk assessment and do what I, I explained before. 
the results of this then goes into the do phase, uh, looking into we might need to update documentation, uh, define new roles and responsibilities, roll out training and so on and so forth. Going into the check, uh, the implementation side, do you, you actually implement those things that you have already de determined uh, that should be done? And also, are these things effective enough or are there any parts of uh, requirements of, uh, of action here and going into continuous improvement? When we look at uh, deploying this, uh, we need to make sure that uh, people on board and also onshore get new roles and responsibilities that are supporting the implementation of the management system. Uh, we recommend to base it on already uh, the current structure of the organization as it is uh, and not making a, a separate, uh, completely anonymous or, or segregated uh, section that deals with the matter. Uh, then define what could be typical tasks for them and, uh, and identify who is the most uh, practical person to do this on board a vessel to support a master. It might be the second officer. It doesn't necessarily have to be someone that is defined as the ship cybersecurity officer, but at least someone that has that, those kinds of actions and roles and responsibilities uh, in, in combination with the master to ensure that things are getting uh, a, are done and not just on the paper. The same thing goes on the onshore side, define someone that has an overall perspective to support and report directly to the DPA and the general management uh, that has uh, the, the control and the steering the, the, the cybersecurity team where also the IT department will be and also the OT uh, system owners, uh, the superintendents. Then roll out a generic uh, uh, awareness training for everyone, both shoreside and shipside. And then make sure that you, if you have a specific uh, situation for your vessels, for your uh, organization, then also make sure that the, this is trained that the new management system requirements and so on is, uh, is well supported for those people that has now to use them. What we typically also see is it's nice to, to execute this uh, as, as a follow-up activity. Uh, is this actually working as we uh, intended? Is a survey, uh, both looking at the general awareness, but also on day-to-day on -day business. How do they execute their day-to-day -day, uh, tasks and how would they report and respond to an emergency situation? Based on that output, you can then update and, and launch new trainings that uh, then patches those uh, gaps. Okay, uh, before I wrap up, we'll get into a little bit of the details, at least of the class notation uh, that uh, DMV launched, uh, I believe, two years ago already. Um, already in the main class rules, uh, also aligned with the URE22 from IAX, uh, we have some few principal requirements uh, in there. But uh, there is a, definitely a need also to, to have these notation and type approval schematics uh, for those that are already that mature and, and willing on a voluntary basis to apply them. They can be applied for both vessels in operation and also for new building projects. Uh, the baseline and uh, what this derived from is this ISC uh, 62443 standard that I mentioned before as a control system cybersecurity standard. And we as the NVDL, we made it, uh, tailored it uh, also the requirements to be applicable on board vessels. Um, the principle behind this uh, is, uh, of these requirements is actually a defense in depth model. Uh, there are requirements making sure that uh, the physical and procedural security is in place, that the human barrier is not jeopardized. The second one is to look at the, the ship itself. Uh, how is the integration between the different systems, between the different networks, and also how is the access from the outside world, the remote access and so on. So those types of requirements are in here. And finally, the system themselves individually as they stand, how are they hardened? Um, are the data kept on these systems and also sent to the outside world? Are they encrypted? Uh, what about how, how do you access these systems? Who has the authentication and authority to access them? Uh, how do we treat uh, malware uh, detection and so on and so forth. 
So that is the, the baseline to try to have three different types of barriers in order to protect ourselves the best. Who is then uh, yeah, concerned of all this? Well, the, the requirements, as I mentioned in the beginning, is very much uh, the IMO focus right now is the owner. Uh, but the class notation actually has to focus on all three major players when we talk about building a vessel. So manufacturers, yards, and owner. And the type approval is, of course, to, to focus and help the manufacturer uh, to, to have a, yeah, a standardized uh, uh, system or component that can then be integrated into uh, uh, to a new built project uh, in a more easy and straightforward process than having to do it uh, or from the beginning from scratch for each system or components. The class notation is very flexible. Uh, it uh, ranges from the cyber secure, the, the entry level, and then the essential, and then the advanced. Uh, all these levels have the same scope. I'll come back to that uh, the next level, uh, next slide. But uh, it comes to uh, the requirements of how high the security uh, has to be. So. So adding on each of these levels are further requirements to the same type of um, uh, area. So in, for instance, uh, system authentication, is it one, one uh, login credential that is needed or do you need dual authentication, for instance? Like this could be the, the higher and higher uh, requirements that are is then implemented. Um, we typically see and, and we recommend that uh, um, for ships in operation, for the cyber secure, the entry level or the essential is uh, is a good match. And for the more complicated vessel and more high value uh, vessels, the higher uh, class notation levels should be selected. There's also a possibility then to com be completely free and flexible as you as you wish. So implement a cyber secure plus notation, which then would actually add or remove systems or add or lower the security requirements uh, up or down and system that might be relevant here could be a casino system uh, for a cruise vessel or maybe a drilling uh, a system on a drilling rig. These are the 10 standard systems as I said before uh, they are common for for all of them except for the plus and it's all about safeguarding the vessel so it's very much in the focus of control systems focus on safeguarding the life and property and the environment. So uh, propulsion, uh, navigation, and so on. Okay, I want to wrap up now and get to questions and answers. But before I do that, I just want to, to point this out I, because I believe that the, this is very true. We see the way ahead uh, is that um, we as the we, we we believe the stakeholder demands will continue to increase. Uh, right now we see that charters, not only the oil majors, but even uh, charters for a, a container vessel actually starts making specific demands, even uh, once to have certifications, not necessary to a class notation, but could also be to ISO standard or something else uh, before they sign for, for the new contract. Uh, service engineers uh, are starting to get questions as well. Uh, in their service uh, agreements with, uh, with their, their clients. Uh, how are you making sure that your, uh, your employees are secure when they are coming on board the vessels? Are they, uh, what kind of cyber hygiene or principles are they utilizing? Are they trained and so on and so forth? Huh? Insurance companies uh, are starting to, or have already in the past, uh, in the last couple of years, but it's starting more and more to ask about uh, are you managing your cyber risks? And if you are, uh, how well? Uh, not only on, on the paperwork, but actually also going on board and checking the implementation. And the better they are doing this, uh, the better premium or even the possibility to get uh, the cyber part of the risk also covered. Banks, uh, they want to safeguard their investments. So of course they're interested in cybersecurity. I believe this will increase in the future as well. And regulators, they are just in the beginning of making up uh, new regulations and demands to, to our industry to, to, uh, to fulfill. Okay, thank you so much. That was my presentation. And I will stop sharing right now.
Thank you very much to both um, to both of our speakers. Um, we had some very interesting presentations, and um, I have to say that the points you have both raised um, are actually going to affect uh, most of us in the in the shipping industry, and, and not only. Um, we have already received a few questions, um, so we can uh, we can start with those um, and start the discussion. Um, so let's uh, start with uh, Juan Forgostas um, for the different voluntary cyber class notations that you have um, mentioned and are, not, and are offered by DNV. Um, do you already apply this to any of the vessels? And if so, what types of vessels? Oh, thank you very much. This is a, a nice question. Uh, yes, we have already have uh, 50 vessels apply that. At the moment, there's only few because, I, as you know, if you want to, to build a vessel, it may, needs a couple of years to be built. So there's only few operating at the moment, but it's about 50 vessels now contracting to have uh, cybersecurity notations. And I think 30 only this year. So from January to now, we have only 30 vessels, which is quite a lot, you know, compared to the 50 that we have only for the last two years. And, and, and applies to any type of vessels from from bulk carriers, tankers, containers, mega yachts, passenger vessels, any type of vessels. Yeah. Excellent. How long ago did you start offering this uh, this class notation? Uh, as Van der have said, it's two years ago we started. Ago. Um, excellent. So um, another one for um, Svante will go for, on top of the IMO requirements on cyber risk management, will any other requirements become mandatory in the near future for um, classification? And if so, what requirements? Yeah, that, that is a good question. Uh, it's always hard to look into the future. Um, I know that um, IMO has taken at the moment a step backwards and uh, is looking at the industry to uh, foremost uh, to implement these uh, requirements as they are at the moment. Uh, but they are relying, of course, on IAX as in many cases else. And IAX, as I mentioned before, came out with the rec uh, recommendations last year. And I know there is a working group on this within IAX to, to make this into uh, requirements uh, that will then come to effect. If that will be next year or the year after, I'm not sure, I, I cannot tell, but uh, that is at least the intention, yeah. I see, okay. So um, following up on that and the, the class notations, um, Costas, um, I understand DNV and uh, I think the Korean Register has um, other two, the first two classification societies already introducing that notation. Um, do you see that becoming compulsory for all DNV class vessels or generally between uh, classification societies? And uh, would that notation require annual endorsement? This is another excellent question again. As Zvanda just mentioned, yes, Ajax is looking into, as you know, the safety of the vessel. So if a cyber attack will uh, harm the safety of the vessel, then of course, you know, Ajax has to implement something. And because we are part of the Ajax, then of course this will be mandatory. And if it's going to be mandatory, then of course has to be have annual endorsement, as we just said. Understandably, right. Um, okay, so um, another one, we've had a question about how to implement, execute, plan, implement, execute cybersecurity, which um, to a large extent does want to actually address in his um, presentation. I don't know if there's anything more you would like to add or uh, potentially talk about um, maybe the typical DOC audit finti findings related to cyber risk management from this year, uh, from uh, mm. the data you have gathered? Well, um, you said, so that is clear, we, um, my team, uh, where I'm sitting, we are the advisors, we are the consultants uh, within DNB that helps our clients to, to improve uh, and also check in, in the sense of uh, executing pen testing exercises or and these different things. But uh, we have a separate, uh, separated um, unit that is working as ISM auditors uh, on behalf of, 
of our flag states as a recognized organization. And uh, already now through working with our clients that we have, we get, uh, of course, the first ones have had their DLC audits already. Uh, so we see these reports, not only from D&D, but also from other uh, uh, DLC audits. And uh, I would say, uh, interesting enough, is that uh, I have not seen any non-compliances so far uh, myself. I know that there are, but I haven't seen them myself. Uh, but the focus had been rather on recommendation or, or these observations huh? where the, uh, the DOC auditor has seen, okay, it's great that you have a nice documentation, but where are the proofs that you are actually living by it? Huh? Uh, many people focus on making a risk assessment, making maybe a, a do's and don'ts, uh, security principles somewhere, but not necessarily recording that uh, uh, cyber security training has been executed, uh, that people are now uh, implementing the change management or work permits and so on that, that is needed in order to execute uh, software updates or something like this. So, so that will, I believe, is the focus. Uh, we have the first step, uh, making the improvements, but now the, the implementation is uh, still a challenge. Yeah, I understand that will take uh, quite some time for most um, shipping companies to introduce uh, new processes. Um, now, in another interesting one is, um, especially in this day and age with all modern vessels, there's a constant flow of information between uh, the ship and the, um, and, and the office. Um, so I would, as, as you mentioned in your presentation, that it will have to be actually looked at as a whole. Um, do you recommend your, your members, the shipping companies, to have external audits um, for the cybersecurity systems? And um, if you see that becoming a requirement, I know you did mention uh, that obviously the DIMO requirements coming up, but if you'd like to talk about that a bit. Because... Sure. Um... Yeah, I believe that, that uh, as I mentioned before, uh, going on board the vessel is, is, is definitely key, uh, especially on this implementation part uh, to check that. Uh, and I believe it should be done by the company themselves uh, from internal audits. Uh, it should be done through, through the uh, DLC audit or, or, the, or the onboard audit uh, that comes to, uh, after that. Um, but I believe that is a little bit too little. Uh, the, the time is not enough to go into the details of cybersecurity when you are on board. Uh, as I mentioned before, the Port State Control sur uh, Survey will scratch on the surface. Uh, and, and that is a good starting point. But I believe in order to really make sure that the barriers are in place, that uh, uh, many of our customers are then uh, actually paying uh, a lot of money for, then you have to test, you have to uh, scan, you have to uh, get your hands dirty. We see multiple times, we see nice uh, firewalls being bought, uh, also uh, brought to the vessels, but uh, the cables are not plugged in or the com they are not configured in that sense. So, so it, it's, you know, you have already paid for a lot of money, but uh, but it's this, the security is not given just by doing that. Indeed, and uh, I picked up a new presentation that you did mention about uh, taking the third parties that are boarding the vessel one updates they're installing, which is uh, it is a very good point because you can you can try to do your own housekeeping, but actually you have to you have to introduce uh, some extra layers for the for the people coming on board. Um, Right, I think that is about all the questions we have uh, gathered for today. If um, anyone else would like to send something in, um, or maybe Costas would like to um, tell us a bit more about the feedback he's getting from, uh, from the members in terms of uh, this new um, initiative. Um, <laughs> oh, we're getting a question. If we can issue any cyber training certificate to the participants based on the ISM requirements. 
Well, we have an uh, uh, e-learning course about cybersecurity now that you mentioned mm. about certificates, which you can get a cybersecurity certificate. And it's not long, it's a bit for, you know, for half an hour, something like that. Uh, it's not an extensive one, but at least, you know, what you have to and not have to do, you know, while you're on board the vessel and also in the, in the office. So this is something that we can offer, cybersecurity training. Yes, we have. Excellent. Maybe some some checklist for the superintendents when they go on board and we can actually. Um, now, now that you mentioned that, now now that you mentioned that, we have in our webpage. You know, if you have a DNB gel vessel, you have a, a checklist that you can go through, um, and you can check. You know, how is your system against uh, what's the system, what is the standard in the, in the industry? So we have that also a checklist. Yeah, that you can do anytime. Excellent. I will. I will go and check that one out. Um, lovely. So um, I believe this would be as uh, the webinar coming to an end. Thank you very much to both of our speakers, uh, Kostas and Vande, for sharing all of this very valuable information with us. Um, I'm sure you can go on to the DNV website and find more information about cybersecurity. Um, thank you very much to our audience for joining us today. The recording will be available on our YouTube channel very shortly. You can follow all our social media platforms uh, where you can find information about our events. Our next scheduled event for the SPNL is on the 30th of June, which will be co-hosted with Waves Group to talk about my time energy transition and introduction of LNG. We hope to see you all then. Have a lovely day and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much.